Today we're out in the desert at a small railroad station. In fact, this railroad station is so small, I can literally walk through it in a matter of seconds. Had you fooled there for a minute, didn't I? Well, I wasn't kidding. This is actually a small railroad station in the desert. But we're actually in the back lot of a company called Sessons Engineering. They specialize in live action miniatures for film and television. Let me show you an example of some of the work they've done by taking a look at these clips. Jack, what we just seen is a clip from Stephen King's movie, Sometimes They Come Back. This looks like the same car to me. Is, is this actually what you used? This is uh, one of the cars that we didn't have to use because um, the ones that we did use worked so well, and we always have extras. This car, a uh, 55 Chevy two-door sedan, had to be built a special way so that when the train impacted it and flipped it, the camera caught the destroyed part of the car, which we made out of lead. The rest of the car is made out of a um, polyurethane two-part mix that we use in rubber molds. The car had to have operating headlights and in pretty much every way matched the original 55 Chevrolet that the first unit used back in Missouri. Mm -hmm. What about the train? Is this uh, the same train or a similar train? This is the same locomotive we used in the filming. It's a model of the Southern Pacific 5000 class 4102 and um, it took three and a half years to build it. Well, in the movie, it was in a tunnel, and it was dark, and there was lots of explosions. Can you tell us a little bit of maybe some of your trade secrets and how you create those explosions? Well, the tunnel, of course, was a um, breakaway tunnel with one side completely open so that we could get the cameras in. The explosions were all created with uh, using uh, various forms of magnesium and black powder, and we use very low, low compression so that we don't totally destroy the, um, the miniature. We want it to come apart in a manner similar to that of a real one. Um, and of course, we film at a very high speed. What do you mean that you film at a high speed? Of course, we're going to talk to your cameraman later, but can you just tell us what, what do you mean by that? Well, what, it's what we call the inertia speed. Um, as you know, uh, film is projected back at 24 frames a second. And if you were to drop this car, for example, at 24 frames a second, it's going to look like a little toy. But because of the scale of this car, if we drop this particular car at 84 frames a second, when it hits on film projected back at 24 frames, it's going to have a realistic bounce to it, as the explosions do when they go off. Well, in a lot of the clips we saw, too, there's a, a lot of trains, and, you know, tough guys and um, the Stephen King film clip that we've seen. Do you specialize in trains, or is that just something that we just happen to see a lot of? Well, trains are my hobby. In fact, that's how I got into this business. But um, we have uh, 20 locomotives here at our uh, facility here. We can just about cover every era, period piece, and type of um, situation that might arise up through the modern day. And uh, it's just that trains are our thing. and. Um, we would much rather do trains because they are much more predictable than planes. They're on tracks and they don't crash unless you want them to. <laughs> well, these are not just, you know, your regular toy play trains. I mean, these are heavy duty, um, mechanically run trains. They must, they must be expensive and you must have to be very careful not to destroy them. Well, the trains are all built um, from scratch. This locomotive here weighs um, just right at 400 pounds. It operates on 120 pounds of boiler pressure. It is a live steam locomotive, and it was under steam during the filming. Tough guy, the tough guy locomotive we used, which was the Southern Pacific Daylight, it also weighs in at just under 400 pounds, and it was traveling at 25 miles an hour in that final crash sequence, actual speed. 
Um, it's just a lot of, it's a labor of love. It's a lot of work to build these things. You, you can't go out and buy kits and put them together. You, uh, you have to build every part. And they're all metal. What's the reason that a, a film or a production company would contact you to do a certain sequence in their film? Mainly because um, we can do it a lot more inexpensively and a lot safer. Um, we do. We specialize in explosions. We can blow up a um, an automobile for one twentieth the cost of doing it for a real one. Um, the trains and uh, people just can't afford to go out and buy a train and blow it up and wreck it. They can't afford to crash planes, so that's where we come into play. Let's take a, a look over in your shop and take a look at some of the things that you did for Hot Shots. All right, let's do it. So, Jack, this is your shop, and we're with some of the stuff that was used in the movie Hot Shots. Why don't you tell us a little bit about of the strange, bizarre thing I'm holding here and what you did with it? Well, it's a microphone, and it has a windscreen no, no, on it. No, 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 oh, no. this. Yes, oh, yes, yes. okay, this is the actual uh, sign we used that you saw the plane fly through. It, uh, for those of you that couldn't read it because it happened so fast, it says, Smoke, Nobody Lives Forever. And what we did is we propelled the plane through it uh, with uh, high pressure. And, of course, the plane broke through, and everybody believed it was a real plane flying to a sign. Oh, so you just gave away a little secret there in the movie. What, secret, right. Mm -hmm. What they saw was this plane, actually. This plane, and it is real. It's just smaller. <laughs> This is true. <laughs> okay, so we have a, a ship here behind us, the uh, SS SS that was also in the in the film. Um, tell us a little bit about what you use this for, because I heard that they actually had to build a deck on the side of a mountain in order to use, because they couldn't get a hold of a, a ship at that time. So where did this come into play? Right. Well, the Navy would not cooperate with them at all. So um, with a combination of building a full-size deck, 300 by 100 feet, in the parking lot at Marine Land, we were also able to tie in the superstructure that we built with an optical setup. Now, it's very difficult to describe what that is because it only works from one angle, and that's through the lens of the camera. But when you see the girl riding her horse down the deck of the carrier, there's really no carrier from above the um, basic 20-foot levels, which is as high as they built it. And the rest of it is this. The bottom portion you see here is built to roughly half inch to the foot. It's the first uh, 15 feet in our scale, which takes us back to the actual launching rigs on a carrier. And we actually, in the movie, actually launched these airplanes off of the deck of this carrier with a bungee rig. And the shots you saw were shot from underneath where actually the plane's actually being launched. The other aircraft you see here is the one-sixth size aircraft that we use for all the landings on the carrier. When you see the aircraft landing and the hook grabs, we use this size aircraft. We use this for the um, flying sequences where the little man was hanging out and kicking. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these are two basic scales we used in the uh, filming of the film. Mm. This uh, aircraft that you're looking at right now is one of our um, roustabout aircraft. It's uh, suffered many damages. It's uh, flown into a car. It's had the tail cut off. It's had the nose cut off. We cut the tail off and mounted it on the camera and uh, used it for the uh, point of view of the missiles following the plane. We cut the nose off and used it on the front of the camera for the pilot's POV of the plane flying above the desert floor uh, with the freeway sign where it said nuclear power plant next exit. And um, so then we put it all back together and we um, set it on fire a couple of times. It's, uh, it's been around. It hit a car in an intersection during the downtown flying sequences. So it's uh, been around. Max, this looks like the aftermath of something. Can you explain what we're looking at? Well, that, it definitely is aftermath. This was designed as aftermath. Where this fits into the film is uh, after Charlie Sheen has been through the mother of all air battles and he blows up the nuclear power plant and flies off in a fireball, we don't see what happens to him until later in the film. Everybody's sad. They all think Charlie's been killed. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, he just drops out of the sky onto the deck. And that's what was dropped. They tried to do this in first unit with a real plane. They couldn't do it. They had to come back to us. Your pickle's hot. Pack. Bombs away. <laughs> Thank you.
Michael, being that your job is the cameraman, it's really your responsibility to make this look as real as possible. How do you do that? Well, we try to set up the camera where a real person would look at a real train, and that is about the same height. Instead of, if you were looking at a real train, you'd be standing about five foot five off the ground. And if this train is about 12 or 18 inches tall, obviously would have to put the camera down literally on the ground. Also, trains travel at a known speed rate, and they have a, a, a volume, a density, a mass, and all that. And we uh, approximate that with camera speeds and film speeds and various lenses. So essentially, when you uh, shoot it, it looks like a miniature. But when it comes back from the lab, it looks real. So there's a lot of factors involved, you know, the angle of the camera, the lens that you use. So you must do a lot of your work on the ground, right? I wore knee pads for years. <laughs> and uh, then the final thing that happens is then the studio gets the film, and they put in all the great sound effects and uh, real train noises and all that. And it's, it makes it look like a million dollars. So you shoot with no sound then and just take, you know, once the film is done, take it to the studio and it's basically up to them what they use and what they don't use and what kind of sounds they put in it? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, our trains make different noises than a, a, a large train would make. Plus, our cameras are louder than the typical studio cameras, which are very silent. And also, the third reason is that when we're filming, we get to yell at each other a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so. Which I'm sure doesn't happen. <laughs> Never. <laughs> well, how did you get started doing miniatures as opposed to life-size things? We were shooting for a show called The Fall Guy, uh, a, a few partners of mine and Max, and uh, one day a producer just called us up and said there's some guys out in the Inland Empire who have uh, trains and boats and planes and they need somebody to shoot the stuff for them. Why don't you go out and shoot for them? So we came out here and pretended that we knew everything there was to know and they said, no, 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 you've got to do miniatures a certain way. And they kind of taught us out here how to shoot miniatures. And then together we've sort of perfected the art and brought it up to a level that was uh, miniatures were pretty widely used in uh, the 30s and the 40s in films and only in the 60s and 70s did they use a lot of real things and then of course I'm sure Jack has already explained that miniatures are back in vogue because of the relatively cheaper and they're a lot safer there have been some well widely publicized accidents on movie sets in the past few years that would have been avoided with the use of miniatures. And of course, we are very strongly prejudiced. We feel that we could have given them the same look with our technology that they tried to do in real life. What would you say was your biggest challenge? My biggest challenge is getting along with these guys. <laughs> Should I be more specific? <laughs> uh, my, the biggest challenge uh, will be when it is when we do something that's really large scale and I mean very expansive. For instance, at the, uh, the climactic action scenes in the movie Flight of the Intruder called for us to blow up an entire town square in Hanoi. And uh, that required about five cameras shooting simultaneously. And um, we had to figure out where to put all five cameras so they wouldn't be looking at each other and at the crew and at the lighting. So we kind of had to hide the lighting and get everything on film in a minimum amount of takes because it was so expensive to do. So that was the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Max, tell us now, you're the production manager. Mm -hmm. What exactly does that mean? What is your responsibilities? Well, basically, we get the contracts, and then I go out and put everything together. Michael and Jack are mostly the creative aspect of it. Um, I know I've been asked this question in the past when I tell people what I do with miniatures. They say, oh, yeah, well, you get a couple of little toys and a little camera, go out there and shoot. Well, it's a lot bigger than that. When we're actually in full production, I'll have like 15 people on the set, sometimes more than that. And there's trucks and cranes and there's locations. There are people to be fed. That's the most important thing I do. <laughs> Lunch is a big deal. Yeah, I get a lot of complaints if it isn't good. Working on a set that they used in Flight of the Intruder, these three gentlemen are what makes what you have just seen happen. Jack Sessons is the owner and creator of such effects. 
Michael Sabell is the cameraman, and Gary Maxwell, known as Max, is the production manager. Together, these three, along with many other talented people, bring to life the impossible action shots you see in the movies. Before we close, I just wanted to point out one thing, and that's this mountain here behind me, which actually looks like a mountain, but it's not a real mountain. Actually, it was used in the movie Hot Shots in the flying formation of the five jets and the one in the middle turned sideways to make it through that V. Well, this is actually what you saw. Well, I hope you learned a lot about live action miniatures today, because I know we did. I'd like to thank Sessons Engineering for letting us come out. I'm Terry Olet for Inland Entertainment, and as they say, that's a wrap. You guys smell smoke? <laughs>